Uh, hello, Chin Yu. Thank you very much for joining us for this interview to share a little bit about yourself to everyone that is watching this video. Now, as a start, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about what you do at Provident. Uh, I'm a client advisor at Provident uh, and I help clients work through their most uh, important goals, then help to plan out how we can best enable them. Yeah, so um, maybe you'd like to share with us a little bit about your you know, career history, the journey that you have taken, and actually, you know, what made you join this industry, which is pretty new for you, right? So maybe you can mm. share with us, you know, this whole entire journey of finally transiting from somewhere that you are so comfortable with uh, to a place whereby, uh, yeah, totally unfamiliar in the past. Okay, so this is actually quite a, a long story. Uh, I graduated in 2010 from uh, NTU Material Science and Engineering uh, and I graduated with first class honours and valedictorian of the cohort. So I thought that I did quite well studies wise, uh, but I actually did not have a very clear idea about what I wanted to do at that time. Uh, mostly what went on in my mind was uh, I have a good degree and I should be trying to maximise my career prospects and earnings while balancing my own personal interests to a certain extent. Then I came across Singapore Airlines, uh, which a friend told me about. So I applied for the engineering specialist role, uh, but they also shared with me a generalist track, which uh, you will get exposed to a range of different roles uh, across the company. So I thought that was quite interesting. And I'm always keen to expand my scope of knowledge. So I took up that track. So in terms of my career history, my first thing was in revenue management. And my job was basically to do a lot of data analysis of historical passenger demand, revenue, forecasting the future demand as well. So we can optimize the various ticket prices that sold to the market. SIA was your first job? Uh, yes. Your first job, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, sorry. So you're talking about revenue and all that. That was what you were in charge. Correct, correct. So I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, a lot of numbers, you try to forecast. Uh, basically, you know, your airline prices go up and down. That's basically what I was doing at SIA. Uh, so I'm a numbers person and I thought the role suited me very well. Spent two years there and I think that shaped a lot of my interest and skill set in terms of the numerical analysis uh, portion of financial planning. Uh, so after that two years, I applied for what we call the overseas manager scheme, uh, where you have to put your hand up, uh, go through an interview to be placed overseas. Uh, with the with the aim to become an overseas uh, general manager or VP. So I got accepted into the pool, uh, but I still needed to get experience in head office. So they placed me next in the internal audit, uh, which was quite useful to learn the ins and outs of how everything works uh, in SIA. Uh, because the airline is actually quite a complicated business. Uh, so you need to get as much exposure across everything as possible, you know, from finance, PR, marketing, sales, uh, operations, services, uh, HR, uh, especially if you want to become a GM. So halfway through my time with internal audit, uh, actually HR contacted me to say they've shortlisted me together with three other candidates to go for an interview with CEO for a staff assistant position. Uh, basically, it, it is a position to serve the chairman and CEO. So this is actually quite a rare opportunity for me uh, as you get exposure at a very senior and board level um, while you also get the visibility in a large organization like SIA. Uh, at the time, there were actually two staff assistant roles, one for SIA, one for Tiger Airways. Who so I got the role... Sorry? Who was the CEO then that you went for the interview with? The CEO? Yeah, at that time. Uh, CEO was Chumpong, Go Chumpong. Okay. Yeah, but I didn't get the SIA staff assistant role. I get the Tiger Airways one. Yeah, so Tiger Airways, uh, the chairman at the time was Mr. J.Y. Pillay. Right, right. So he was also the ex-chairman or managing director of SIA, GIC, MAS, I think S yeah, SGX, DBS. Uh, and he was actually also the chairman of the Council of Presidential Advisors of Singapore at the time. So basically, he's the acting president. So uh, it was a very, very big honor and privilege for me to be working directly under him. Probably a yeah. better Sorry? Probably a better deal than being accepted by SIA. Yeah, it was very, uh, it's, it's really a very, very rare opportunity. I mean, there's pros and cons of each. Uh, but for someone like him, you get to uh, see how he worked in certain ways. 
Uh, but even the CEO at the time, Ping Yen, I thought he was a very, very smart man. Uh, now my CEO is also a very smart man. <laughs> uh, but I thought that I learned a lot from, from all of them. So for a while, I, 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 was, I wasn't sure who you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so actually now we can ask you uh, to predict the price next year for, for SIA fares. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's not something I can do anymore. <laughs> In yeah. fact, the time was uh, predicting uh, demand, so I, I know what to charge passengers. So, so it seems like you know you had a pretty illustrious career. I mean, at least during that period before you left and joined us. I mean, SIA um, is a very well-known company, you know, good company. Of course, unfortunately, because of this COVID-19, you know, now it's uh, going through uh, tough times. Uh, I mean, people who have got a long history in SIA, good job, probably good pay, good benefits, wouldn't be thinking about leaving, right? So actually, what made you decide, or what made you even thought about leaving, you know, and venturing into something that's totally new? Yeah, so the my whole career was very long. So after that, basically, I, go to, I went to Jakarta, went to Canberra, went to Sydney. Uh, so in total, I spent about uh, nine years in SIA. Uh, Canberra was the one that I thought was quite quite interesting. Uh, basically, they threw me in the deep end. Uh, I was there with two temporary staff. Uh, I needed to set up uh, the the operations. I mean, I have a team supporting me, but I had to set up operations. I need to build up the team. I had to build up the office from scratch. Uh, turn the uh, from a domestic operation uh, airport to become something that's ready for international. Um, so that was quite tough, but quite rewarding in a sense as well. So uh, why I choose to move, uh, it's, it's got to do with more of, on the personal side of uh, my, my, my story. So basically, I started learning about personal finance uh, after I earned my first paycheck. And of course, along the way, there's a lot of uh, financial salespeople who are very keen to speak to you. And I'm, I'm someone who always likes to ask questions. Uh, what's the basis for this? Why do you say that? Uh, is that something that you're not telling me? Or is that something that actually you don't even know yourself? So after speaking to them, I would go back and forth and do tons and tons of research um, to you validate my decision. Like all financial sales people don't want to talk to. La. Yeah, I, I, I think they don't like to talk to me also. <laughs> uh, but, but the more I dig, the more I become very fascinated with how I can optimize my finances. And that was how I started my whole obsession about financial planning, which is another whole industry by itself. Uh, but while that is a, a, a sort of a passion and a hobby, uh, it just stayed that way. So in the early years, like I mentioned, uh, I wanted to just do well in my job, uh, advance up the career ladder, and uh, starting from scratch wasn't really part of the question. Uh, because that would mean that I'll be slower than others in this race. Or oh, that was how I viewed it at that time. You know, life is a race, and if I restart in a career, uh, I'm sort of losing out already. Uh, in fact, some of uh, at some point, I actually wanted to explore being an actuary because of my whole obsession over numbers and, uh, and all that. But I dropped the idea because that would mean setting me back a few years. Yeah, but I would say life priorities change along the way, uh, especially when you get older you realize that it's a never-ending comparison if you're always concerned about uh, where you stand versus others. Uh, you start to place more weight on other aspects of your life, such as family or pursuing a particular purpose that you strongly believe in. So uh, vent venturing into this whole new industry uh, or passion of mine has always been at the back of my head, but I didn't have the courage to do so. Uh, but it was only about three to four years back that I seriously thought about what I actually wanted for my future. Uh, does continuing on to advance the career ladder give me fulfillment? Or does making more money provide me more happiness? And what, what do I need this money for? And um, basically, you have to bear in mind that uh, the time you're trading off is something that you, are, you, you can never get back. So basically, I became very clear that life isn't a race or comparison and you want to derive your own meaning internally and what gives you the greatest joy. So from then on, the thought of starting from scratch is not an, an issue for me anymore. Yeah, so you finally did design. 
and I remember you told me that you know your boss tried to dissuade you, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe share with us, you know, what happened, you know, what was the conversation <laughs> then, you know, and how come he failed, you know, he didn't manage to do it. Yeah, I was actually quite nervous on that day uh, that I decided to hand in my resignation letter. Uh, like I said, I shared earlier, SIA was my first and only job. So actually, I've never done this before. Uh, and it was actually during a time where we were undergoing quite a few major organizational changes over in Australia. So uh, things were uh, very busy at the time. So I braced myself. I walked over and asked, uh, do you have a minute to speak? Uh, and when I first said that I would like to hand in my letter of resignation, his first reaction was, ayo. So, but then I explained that actually I'm perfectly happy working at my current role. There was no push factor in any way. There's nothing that I'm unhappy about working at SIA, but rather a very strong pull factor in pursuing something that I really wanted to do, which is in financial planning. So to side, sidetrack a bit, previously I actually requested to be posted back to Singapore, where I'm closer to home and can actually explore my <clears throat> passion to get to know Provident a bit more while still working with SIA. So he mentioned that there were plans to move me into planning roles in head office since I was interested in planning. Uh, and he also shared that actually uh, you're due for a promotion and to see whether this was factor into my consideration. Uh, so with regard to the planning role, I shared that this wasn't exactly the same as what I wanted to pursue. Uh, it's very different. In financial planning, we always say it's actually life planning where you make a big difference to someone's life. And the purpose is very different from a corporate planning role, which of course the aim is to maximize returns for the company. Uh, and to the point of promotions, I told him that money and titles actually have very little significance in my consideration. Uh, the bigger driver, the biggest driver in all of this is to uh, go for something that I feel excited waking up to every day. And I see it more of a calling rather than work uh, in itself. Uh, and I think he also asked me is that, uh, is this a poor financial decision to do a restart? Since you are talking about financial planning, so he said, hmm, uh, do, do you think that's a good idea uh, financial-wise? You know, you want to be a financial planner. Uh, and I thought that that was quite interesting to think about. Uh, and it also uh, is something that I thought it represents how many people view financial planning. Uh, to me, financial planning is top top, maximizing the wealth you have, uh, or to go for the highest paying job, or to chase after the highest returns or ROI. Uh, money is an enabler, uh, and it's about optimizing how it can enable you to pursue the things that, I, uh, that are really important. So this requires you to really sit down and uh, think deep uh, into how do you define success for yourself and how are you allocating time and money in line with your intentions that will bring the greatest fulfillment. So basically, we continue to have a good chat uh, for about two hours on different topics. And at the end of the meeting, he asked uh, if I could firstly reconsider my decision or uh, if not delay my departure due to uh, what I mentioned, a major reorganization happening at that time, uh, which I agreed to that. Uh, but he also mentioned that he would be happy to have me back uh, any time down the road if I decide to change my mind. So I, I thought that was very nice of him. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually I can really... Uh, empathize with him, you know. Yeah, to have a good staff uh, in the midst of a very busy period and somebody I can really trust, my right hand man, uh, come to me suddenly and say, do you have a minute? I will hate those conversations and of course I've had those conversations before. It's always very painful to let uh, someone go. Lah. And especially someone uh, whom I know will do very well in the current position or in the current organization. But then this person wants to join an industry that generally doesn't have a good name because most people, like what you said, right? most people misunderstand uh, what financial planning, financial advisory, wealth management is all about because we hear of horror stories of what sometimes financial institutions do to their clients. People look at sometimes uh, financial advisory, wealth management and just a uh, sales position. So I can imagine, you know, it's like, why? Why, you know, I mean, if you tell me you're going to join another airline, you know, or that I can understand, right? Yeah. Brand new industry and this industry, right? So, I mean, you must have gone through some research, planning, preparation. 
before you finally make such a big move. Maybe you want to share with all of us, yeah, uh, what were all the preparations that you made? Uh, and then you were sure enough that I think I will be okay. Uh. Okay, so uh, there are basically three parts to my whole preparation before I made the switch. Uh, because firstly, I'm not a huge risk taker. So I need to make sure that firstly, number one, I can still take care of my family. Uh, because I always say I cannot be selfish. This is something that personally I want to pursue, but I have family to take care of. Uh, and I have a wife and a daughter who was three years old at that time. Uh, and basically they followed me around overseas for the past uh, four to five years. Uh, my wife left her job to follow me. So at the very least, I need to ensure I can take care of them. Uh, so uh, being overseas means that we are taken care of or supported with accommodation. We have car. Uh, the school fees uh, are also taken care of, uh, allowances on top of that. So uh, the good thing is that we save uh, quite a large proportion of our income and allowances uh, because we don't spend a lot. Uh, so there are two key benefits to me. One, one is that we, uh, like I said, we don't need a lot to continue on the same standard of living. Uh, number two is we have built up enough assets to ensure that we have sufficient buffer uh, in case anything unforeseen happens. So basically I worked out uh, how much I need when I move back uh, to Singapore, such as uh, home renovation costs, uh, what are the ongoing expenses I need to cover, uh, am I still on track to meeting my own future financial independence goals, my daughter's tertiary education, uh, and then work out whether or not it is still possible for me to make this jump. Um, and uh, the second part actually is more in terms of my qualifications. Uh, because formally, uh, my education, so I, I shared that I studied materials uh, engineering and science. My professional experience is in the airline industry. So there wasn't any formal uh, uh, education, although I was reading up a lot on a personal basis. So my own financial planning for the past uh, nine to 10 years, uh, I've gained quite a bit of knowledge, but these were not in the form of formal qualifications. So the first thing I noticed that uh, everyone in Providence has a CFP qualification. So I said, I think this should be the, the area that I should be looking at first. Uh, so what I did was I looked into getting myself CFP certified. I went to pay for my own self-study course, uh, but because I was overseas, I need to, um, I can't attend the, the physical classes. Uh, but when it comes to exams, I need to fly back and forth just to take the exams. Uh, but actually, there wasn't too much of an issue uh, because I was working for an airline. Just that weekend, I need to fly back take exam, then fly back to Australia again. So I was spending quite a bit of time uh, on the airplane. Uh, but also through the CFP exams, uh, it also serves as a validation that the knowledge I built up informally over the years was actually quite relevant and actually very useful. Uh, so the third part actually was uh, figuring out, okay, how, how can I get into this community? Uh, of course, network-wise, I know people in the airline industry. Uh, if you say you want to switch to a career in a similar industry, you know people and you know who to talk to. But um, um, in terms of the community, I was wondering how do I how do I actually get in. So actually, I've been reading uh, this blog called Investment Modes written by Keith, who is a colleague of uh, ours now. Uh, I, I, I'm a long time reader and I like how deep he goes into his discussion. So I wanted Keith to help me validate uh, my decision from a financial standpoint. So I wrote him to him. Uh, and along the way, he asked me, okay, what industry are you looking at? And so I shared, okay, uh, actually, it's my dream to join Provident. Uh, so in addition to actually helping me review my numbers, he helped me to uh, provide your email address and asked me uh, to reach out directly to you. And uh, I just spent quite a lot of time to draft that email out to you. But uh, long story short, happy that everything worked out well. I mean... Uh, thanks for sharing that. You know, it's really an honor to have you at Provident and uh, of the many firms that you can choose, you chose us. So maybe, yeah, share with us, you know, what, what made you choose Provident? I mean, I'm sure in your own research and you're definitely a research guy, you spend so much time preparation, right? So what actually made you join Provident? Yeah, I can assure you that I researched a lot about Provident prior to coming in. And sending your, um, sending your own mum to be the spy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I first knew about Provident about seven years ago. 
and basically at the time I was researching about CPF. So I, I saw you giving a seminar recorded on YouTube. And as you know, I can be quite skeptical about things. So my, actually my first typical impression was this must be another salesperson selling his product or causes. Um, but as I listened on, I actually found you very engaging and, and funny. So the, the, phrase that, the phrase that I always say that I, I can never forget is <laughs> our government is like our father. It doesn't matter if you agree with me or not. Yeah, so um, I, I thought that, that, that left a very deep impression. Uh, and actually, the topics covered at that time was very useful for me. Uh, but that basically sparked my whole uh, interest in actually what, what is Provident? What, what does Provident do? So I started looking into your website, reading your articles. You have, you have wrote, written a few articles, you know, both on the media as well as on the website. Uh, Follow Provident on social media, subscribe to your mailing list. Uh, so quite a few things that I looked into Provident. Uh, and Along the way, in my own journey of doing my own financial planning and research, I, I learned that using term insurance is the best way to ensure that I'm adequately covered. And investing through index funds is the best way for most people to build wealth. So that is what I've been doing for myself. And I find that it's very, very rare to hear similarly from someone in the industry. Uh, so uh, that was what I thought, firstly, uh, the difference that I noticed. Uh, and through speaking to a lot of people, I can see that most people lack this knowledge uh, and they continue to be invested in expensive products without a proper financial plan in place. And I also realized that the level of competence within the industry in general is uh, not quite there, or perhaps it's just from my own personal experience. Uh, I'm very passionate about topics related to personal finance, but I found it very difficult to find someone even within the industry, to have a meaningful conversation or discussion about uh, real financial planning at the time. So through my research about Provident, uh, I realized that Provident is a firm that strongly advocates term insurance. Uh, very, very rare that I hear this. Uh, and investing also, it's, it's philosoph the philosophy is based on evidence and uh, investing at a low cost. And Provident is uh, with a mission to serve clients through uh, honest, uh, competent and ethical advice. Uh, and basically, uh, it does so through a structure that minimizes uh, as much conflict of interest as possible. And on top of that, uh, I also realized that uh, Provident emphasizes a lot on achieving the life goals uh, rather than just the monetary goals. So I thought that all these align uh, perfectly with my own personal beliefs and principles. And uh, at that time also what uh, moved me was how strongly you fought to change the industry uh, despite a lot of pushback at the time. So Provident just represents to me uh, another extension of myself but uh, at a much larger scale but uh, also with the courage and conviction to really do things uh, in this industry. Uh, but that, but that, that's it, uh, I'm still a very careful person. So earlier you said that I sent my own parents uh, because I want to be really, really confident about my decision to join Provident. So I basically came in as a potential client. I wanted to see for myself what, what is the work that Provident actually does. Uh, but at the same time, I knew that my parents needed some retirement planning. So hence, I paid for my parents to come on board uh, which they have actually benefited from the process. Uh, but this gave me also the confidence that Provident actually do what they preach. Because of course, you can say things on the media, you can say things in the public, but what I wanted to see for myself is what do you actually do for clients? Uh, and uh, apart from that, that also gave me a very good idea on what I would be expecting to do if I become a client advisor myself. Uh, in terms of other, uh, other firms, uh, I actually did... Uh, try to see if there are other potential firms if Provident doesn't accept me. Uh, but there was really no one else that checks all the boxes for me. So you can see the pull factor was uh, so strong that I was willing to give up my long time career in SIA, my nice overseas benefits, being willing to restart my career amongst other things in life. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Shin Yu, for sharing that. That's uh, really very encouraging. Yeah. I also know that you have a, a very encouraging story to share. 
I mean, you have played competitive ice hockey for Singapore, uh, representing the Singapore team. Yeah, uh, because of your decision to move to Australia to work, uh, you had to give it up, right? You have to give up this passion of yours. And I can understand because, you know, my son is a sportsman. I know, you know, you want, after you train so hard, you want to play for uh, the country. Uh, and then to give it, I remember you said you have to return your jersey, you know, I can imagine yeah. that can be. You know, maybe share a little bit with us about that decision of giving up something that uh, you really enjoy, uh, leaving your teammates who you have been training with for a long time. You obviously know how to make important trade-offs in life. Right? Yeah, so maybe share with us on that and how some of these decisions, you know, not just that decision of leaving a good paying job from a prestigious company, but giving up a passionate sport. So how, how, how have that whole decision making process and principles that help you even as you uh, become a client advisor of Provident? I, I suppose uh, that's actually quite quite a similar thought process as the, the earlier thinking about whether I should make the move. Uh, but basically at that time, the priority was very career focused. So I got this opportunity to move overseas, uh, which I thought that that was uh, kind of uh, amongst the most important thing during then, focus on my career. Uh, these are hobbies. Um, uh, you recognize that there are things that you need to give up. So uh, although I enjoy playing ice hockey, uh, like I said, it's something that I recognize that I need to accept giving up here in Singapore if I were to pursue something else that is uh, important to me as well. Uh, and it's actually not only ice hockey, but rather moving overseas meant a lot of other trade-offs also. Uh, that includes not being able to see family as much. Uh, my wife needed to give up her career to join me. I have to accept that I will be in a foreign place with much fewer friends than if I were to stay in Singapore. Uh, but on the other hand, I saw it as a good opportunity, which, which is hard to come by. Uh, to gain experience working overseas and uh, looking back this this thing has benefited me a lot uh, but of course uh, like I mentioned life priorities do change it is never static uh, maybe you have a kid maybe your parents are getting old uh, and then uh, things changes your perspective in life so what what this has taught me is that there are always trade-offs uh, to make in life uh, whether in terms of time or money or attention you choose to place on career or family, health or your own uh, sports uh, or even to the community. But you just have to be very, very clear on what is most important to you. Uh, then I find that your decisions will follow accordingly. So the first step is to be very, very clear about what you want. Uh, because the difficult decision is not what, what do you want. That, that is very easy to answer. People say you can have anything you want, but just not everything. But the, the, the difficult question is, what are you willing to give up? So uh, as a client advisor, uh, my advice for, for clients is uh, always that we want to focus on uh, your life goals. And then if possible, do spend time to really think deep into it. Uh, and if, if that is uh, a bit challenging, uh, always remember to uh, fall back on a principle that you really want to be choosing uh, fulfillment and happiness uh, at the end of the day. What really gives you fulfillment? Money itself is a tool, but how do you use that to, to, to bring you joy? Uh, and what does, what does money mean to you? This is a question that we, we often ask uh, clients. So does it mean uh, to spend more time on family? Or does it mean to be able to climb up the social status ladder because that's important to you? Uh, or does it mean freedom or you want to support something that is more meaningful for you? And these are the questions that uh, only the individual can define for yourself. Uh, and uh, my job as the advisor is to help you guide uh, through these uh, some of these thinking and questions and then work out how do we use money to enable those personal aspirations. Yeah, thanks so much, Chi Yu, for sharing. Uh, those of you watching this video right now, uh, I'll just say that although Chi Yu has joined us for less than a year, uh, I think knowledge and experience 
uh, far surpassed the number of months he has been with us. And I think that's largely because um, that he has spent quite a bit of time reading up about personal finance, but not just reading up, you practice it on your own, you plan for yourselves, but also, um, you know, financial planning, retirement planning, whatever you call it, is really life planning. Right, because as you have correctly put, that at the end of the day, money is an enabler. And for Chin Yu, you have made many, many important life decisions. And because of these decisions, you have got to make trade-offs and financial trade-offs. And so you understand this. So for those of you who are watching this uh, video, if you want to get in touch with Chin Yu, you know, you want to speak with him more, uh, you want to get him to help you with your own life goals, life plan supported by uh, your uh, financials, feel free to write in to us because I am very sure yeah, that uh, he will be able to help you um, not just because of knowledge but because of experience and some of these experience are not gained in the financial services industry. This experience gained through his own personal uh, journey in life, which is a lot more important, right? Rather, I preach a theory, I try to sell you something, but actually I don't do it myself. Yeah, but uh, Chinyu has shared how he has actually practiced uh, many of these principles that uh, Provident has found himself. So feel free to get in touch uh, with us if you would like to speak to him, uh, to get him to help you with your own personal retirement, uh, financial or life plan. So once again, thank you Chinyu for sharing with us a very personal aspect of your life. Uh, and I hope, and I not just hope, I believe that many of the people who watch this Will greatly benefit from this interview. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris.